Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. On today's episode, first time ever culinary student panel. I have three culinary students on the show today. I wanted to give them an opportunity to ask questions. I wanted to ask them questions. I think this is an important episode because, as you know, I think we all need mentorship. Meet Victoria, Michael, and Axel. We get into a lot of different things like why they went to culinary school, what their expectations are after school, and what are some of the critical learnings that they had as soon as they got into the real world of kitchens. They get to ask questions as well regarding burnout, best career advice, and a lot more. I think you'll really enjoy the episode. Stay tuned. Chefs, welcome. This is so. This is the first uh, panel that we're doing with culinary students. So, for the audience that's listening, really quick, if you guys don't mind, we're going to go around. If you could introduce yourself, what culinary school do you represent? Um, if you've worked before in a kitchen, and if you're currently working. For sure. My name is Axel uh, Garcia. I go to Escoffier. Uh, before I started working, uh, just fast food jobs in general before culinary school. But lately, right when I moved out here. Uh, I started getting more into the industry and seeing kind of testing the waters out. It's been pretty, pretty nice. I'll, <laughs> I'll say so. And are you working currently? Currently, yeah, I, I have two jobs. I have two jobs. Uh, I work uh, two one, jobs and full time school. Two times and full time school. Correct. Yeah. yeah wow. Uh, I work uh, grill, uh, lead a line cook at one place. Uh, so that's where like the pressure hits and everything. A bunch of tickets come out and everything. Yeah. And I, I got my other job where it's really Really consistent stuff, beautiful, just love. What station do you work? Uh, I work grill uh -huh. uh, at the other place and uh, bounce around a little, maybe Garmo here. Got it. Yeah. All right. Well, my name is Victoria, and I'm currently at El Paso Community College. I'm at the culinary program. But once I graduate, I do plan on going somewhere else. I'm thinking either New York or somewhere abroad. And I did start working before I was in culinary school. I actually started as a host and then as a server. And then that's when I found out that I love the kitchen. So then they moved me up and I started as prep and then I just moved my way up. And once I was in school, I changed my job. So it's more like a fine dining, but it's been a good what, experience. What's the other place where you're at? Lola Rose. Lola Rose. Shout yes. out to Lola Rose. Yes, it's yeah. a Med Spanish Mediterranean. That's cool. Yes. Uh, my name is Michael Roach. Um, I think... I may be the only one to have a little bit of a different story. Um, I was driving trucks previously. Um, I more so got into this to pursue a passion. So uh, I'm from Augusta Scafier Culinary School here in Austin. And um, yeah, I mean, I was actively working in um, the industry until maybe about a week ago. Uh, my restaurant closed, but I just lined up something else. So. So the first question I have, I think, for all three of you is, why did you want to go to culinary school? Like, what, what, what was the, what, at what point in your life did you say, that's what I want to do? I want to become a chef, or I want to go to culinary school, and I want, I want to learn the culinary arts. Uh, for me, I think it was when uh, I was going in high school. I was in high school, and I was always really active in the food. You know, I, I really loved the uh, the science. Could you say, you know, like the chemistry behind it, learning about like, you know, the Maillard reactions, the pH levels on food, like how it affects cuisine, this and that. And I got really into it, like like almost nerdy, right? And yeah. then I- Did you used to watch a lot of cooking shows? Uh, a little bit of everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, what was what was your yeah. show? Uh, a lot of YouTube. Uh, there's this uh, guy, actually, here in Austin, uh, Joshua Wiseman. Yeah. The guy, really good he's, at cooking. He's the legend. He's a really cool guy. Uh, I watched a lot of his stuff and, and kind of like, not just seeing him, but you know, of course, like the the basics of Gordon Ramsay or uh, Master Chef, and seeing uh, all those shows, I uh, just infiltrated like you know ideas going into the head, and I was just like, wow, this is this is cool stuff, and made me experiment myself and wanting to do some of that stuff. And once I got in, in high school, I heard that we had a culinary class, and I decided to join in. When I found out there's competitions, damn, I'm pretty competitive. I, I I like to say right, yeah, being in sports and everything, and let me try it out. And once I got into it, I started going placing pretty high and I, I won my first competition then I went to this other competition I won a knife kit here and the like, CACC it was back in Arizona my hometown oh, back in Arizona yeah okay. back in Arizona last year uh in high school uh 
we had a competition. Uh -huh. I saw it was sponsored by Scoffier. And it was uh, make a, a nice steak, some carrots, and I believe some roasted potatoes. And I was like, I could do that easily. I did it. I ended up placing second. Uh -huh. And they gave me a scholarship to Escoffier. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. And to this point, it was my senior year. I, did, I had no idea what I was going to do with the life. Maybe go to business, but I never really wanted to have that. That standard, you know, go to college, business, this and that. No, I, I always want to do something different. And when that scholarship hit me, it made me think, what if I go to culinary school? I, I love this. I, I could do this, potentially. Uh -huh. Got in contact, and here I am now. There you go. Nice. So for me, I actually, once I graduated high school, I went to UTEP, which is a university in El Paso. Mm -hmm. And I started off with psychology, but I've always hated You're going to need it, by the way. I know, I know, right? That's probably you probably yeah. should have finished that first. Yeah. So You're I was be always with a lot of personalities yeah. in the kitchen. I was into that, but I hated school ever since I was little. Like I just don't like school. Like I'm a very hyper person, so I don't know. School's just not for me. But so I went into UTEP. I was doing psychology, and I just did not like it. So I told my parents, I was like, no, like I'm not happy here. But when I would go to work, I was a totally different person. Like I loved it. I was so happy there. So then I told my parents, I was like, nah, like I'm gonna switch. And at first, they were kind of skeptical. They were like, are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, yes, like, that's what makes me so happy. And then once they realized that, I mean, I was different and happier, they were like, damn, like, and you, she really you had, wants you to had do worked this. a little bit in a restaurant. So you said you were you serving, and so you had a little bit of restaurant experience. Yes, so you I knew did. what you were getting into. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. My first day there, I was like, okay, like, this is what I want to do. And I remember, like, my second month working there, um, I like wrote a menu for the chef and I wasn't even in the kitchen and he just looked at me like how all funny. He, how was dare like, you? Like yeah, he was like, okay. <laughs> he was like, oh, how cute. He was like, thank you. And then he actually ended up putting two of um, my menu items on his menu. And I was oh, like, oh my God, cool. I was so excited. So then, I don't know, I just kept going up from there and I would just read a lot of books. I would teach myself a lot so, watch videos how you said so yeah. were you fascinated by like by shows by books by just your experience or by all three by books and just like being in that environment like every time i would take like dishes to the kitchen i would just look around and see everyone so focused like just in their element and i love that mm. and i remember asking the chef like oh like can you let me try this and he's like no victoria like you're in the front and then i convinced him and he let me but it wasn't easy no, because everyone was kind of like, what are you doing here? Like, you're a little girl. Yeah. I had just turned 16, so. Damn, so you knew early. Yes. Um, I guess for me, like, figuring out that I wanted to do this, uh, it was years later. So I come from a, a big cooking family on both sides, my mom and dad's side. It's just like I always grew up around, uh, like, my grandma and my mom and, my dad and stuff like that, cooking a lot of big family meals and stuff like that. So it's like, when I learned to cook, it's like, it was almost like through osmosis, you know what I mean? Just watching for so long, seeing them do it all the time and stuff like that. For a while, I didn't even know I wanted to like, get into culinary professionally. It was just one of those things where, you know, I felt like for a long time, cooking is one of those things, you know, I felt like you just do it. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have to do it to survive, or some people don't, but that's how I always felt about food. Um, I think I didn't really get passionate until later, like my friends used to tell me all the time, dude, you cook really well for a home cook, like, you know, and, I, you know, you kind of push it to the side and don't think much of it, but then I realized, you know, how much attention to detail that I, I always put into cooking versus, like, some of my friends and stuff like that, and I was just like, well, maybe I could. Mm -hmm. you know pursue this professionally i always kind of like had a neck for it but then i started falling in love with like different cooking shows and stuff like that and it became like that thing like it was the only thing i thought about all the time even when i was working on like man i wonder what i could do with this meal or with this or you know i started watching shows like master chef and then i knew like i was really hooked when i started looking into different types of cookbooks and stuff like that i'm like yeah, maybe I should pursue this. Mm. Maybe it, it might be for me, you know? So this is, this is a question that I wish I had really thought about when I was a young culinarian, when I was in, still in culinary school. Uh, when I went to culinary school, I only went to culinary school because 
uh, it was a way for me to get out of trouble. I had no desire to be a chef. It was just like, keep everyone off my back. I'm doing something with my life. I'm going to go to culinary school. Once I was in culinary school, I found out that I liked it. I found out I was good at it. So I, I stuck with it. But it wasn't my initial passion. And when I got out of culinary school, I wish someone would have asked me this or maybe maybe even helped steer my answer because I didn't really know what the answer was. So I'm going to ask you all this. What is it that you want to be when you grow up as a chef? Meaning, and don't, don't take this the wrong way, like I'm insulting your age or anything like that. But like when you think about like the type of chef that you want to become, the type of restaurant, or it doesn't even have to be a restaurant, the type of business that you want to be in. Because culinary has a lot of different variations of business. What does that chef look like for you when you say, this is what I'm working towards, and this is how school is going to help me get there? I feel like whatever the highest platform that we can be on, that's where I want to be. Um, I want to learn from chefs and hone my skill set to the point where, you know, maybe James Beard Awards, Michelin stars. I mean, that's not the thing that I'm initially striving for. I just want the skill set behind it, you know. I feel like I've talked to a lot of chefs and, you know, I've always asked people, like, what's the biggest thing to overcome for you mentally as being a chef? And sometimes it's uh, a chef stated to me, imposter syndrome, Mm -hmm. you know, feeling like, you haven't achieved or you don't know. I don't ever want to be in a place where I can't back up what I know or don't have the skill set to back up what I know. That's where I want to be professionally. You know, my biggest dream is owning my own restaurant. And until then, I just want to hone my skill sets to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I feel like as many other culinary students, they want to have their own restaurant. So that's something in the future that I would like to achieve. And also, I do want to, like, inspire other people, I guess, like, in the kitchen and just be a good leader and be a good example because I've had great mentors um, in the kitchens that I've worked at, and they've been great help to me and, like, the rest of the cooks there. So if I could do that for someone, that'd be – that's a goal. Okay. I don't know. uh, Owning the kitchen, uh, owning a restaurant in general, I'm not sure about that. (laughs) It sounds too stressful seeing all the – the things that go down, all the, not only that you have to run the back house, the, uh, the, the front house, the paperwork, the actual numbers that go down. Personally, me, I think uh, I, I see myself being more in the, the kitchen aspect still. Uh, I think if I get too lost into the, to owning my own restaurant and be, you know, that guy, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm ready for that or if I want that. Uh, I want to, I would like to have a high position at a, you know, up to like maybe a CDC Possibly, yeah, exact, but at a good fine dining place, you know, like a place where like cooking just feels like a symphony, you know, where like service is just always immaculate with the people that you love, with people having like the same uh, same interests as you, with the same, not just cooking for like, oh, we got to be the best, like, no, having cooking with like a passion, having wanting to create something with like a background, mm-hmm. with the meaning more mm-hmm. than anything, I would say. Mm-hmm. That's, that's that, that, I think that's what I kind of would would reach for or see myself. Yeah. I'll tell you what I hear from some of you. Uh, You know, you said that maybe you don't want to be a a restaurant owner, which is smart. But one of the things that I've seen a lot of times that school, um, not necessarily school, but sometimes students aren't necessarily thinking about is I hear a lot of people, they want to open up their own restaurant. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you guys a question. How much does it cost to open up a restaurant? Millions. Yeah, uh, I'm sure for, pretty yeah, expensive. It's not, it's not cheap. It's not. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's something that people don't talk about often is it does cost a lot of money. Of Where does that money come from? Not my pocket. Not your yeah. pocket. Yeah. You got to find, it's it's find investors, like, uh, loans. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Saving up. So one of the things that sometimes I think gets neglected and sometimes you go in, in, in culinary school and you're learning uh, the foundations of culinary, how to, how to do things and, and the way that it's done. And then you think, well, I'm going to take this and I'm going to go and open up a restaurant. But you've, you haven't invested in the business skills that are required to open up a restaurant or understanding how, how real estate works or financial capital or anything like that. For those of you that have said that you want to open up a restaurant, and I know you said you wanted to run it, but not open it. <laughs> what are you doing right now to educate yourself? for that as well because it's a it's a two-pronged approach mm-hmm. well right now um at home like i've been going to the library a lot 
uh, I have books at home right now on LLCs and uh, forming S corps and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of deep, you know, detailed stuff or whatever. I have books on uh, writing a business plan and stuff like that. I've really been trying to immerse myself into these things. I know it's not one of those things that's going to happen today or tomorrow, maybe not next year or the year after, but I want to know, you know, where to start my journey. So I've really been trying to read a lot and understand what it is that I need to do, at least on the, you know, on the smaller stage so I can build myself up to the next what, level. One of the things that you said is that you want to get a Michelin star, you want a James Beard, you want to work at the highest level. So now that when you're out in the real world, what are you doing to get in those types of kitchens? Because if I'm going to be very honest with you, it's very hard to get a Michelin star or a James Beard award or any of any of any cooking at the highest level is very hard to understand until you're in it. So are you actively pursuing those types of kitchens to work in? I am. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, I previously worked at a James Beard uh, award winning restaurant. So. I have seen some of how they operate, Mm -hmm. um, but I am still trying to put myself in positions to learn from chefs who know things more or put me in a position to learn more than what I know. know. So you were talking a little bit earlier about giving your chef a menu. When I was a chef, when I'm not a chef anymore, retired, but when I was a chef, I don't know how it would have felt if, if uh, you know, know. someone came to me with like a I menu. Was so like, hey, I have some ideas for you to put on the menu because I'm like, oh, really? Like, I, I'm good with the ideas. But I also understand like there is part of the collaboration that goes involved that, that's involved, and you want people to grow with their ideas. Um, when you're in culinary school and you're learning and you're 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 paying the school so that you could learn, and they're returning the favor by educating mm-hmm. you. But when you get out into the real world, it's a different exchange because now they're paying you. Exactly. And they expect you to know because they don't view it as culinary school. Um, did you find any, um, let me think how I want to word this. Did you find it challenging to go from the pace of culinary school to the pace of the real world? And what are some of, what are some of the things that you learned along the way? Yes. Well, I feel like in culinary school, they don't really teach you and prepare you like how it's going to be in service. Like, yeah, they might tell you like, whatever like work clean like clean as you go all those like little tips but it was hard like they didn't tell me like hey it's gonna be super stressful like you know you're gonna want to go yell in the walk-in cry in the walk-in like cry in the like during service Mm -hmm. um but that's it's been challenging but fun at the same time like figuring it out so what what was like the biggest shocking moment um that you had that's like oh culinary school didn't tell me this like this is this is different for me, it's just, like, the pace, I guess. Like, I feel like, at least in my school, like, they don't really tell me, um, like, hey, it's going to be go, go, go. Like, when you go, like, you know, like, try to not just talk too much. or Because I'm a talker. I love talking to my coworkers. And that's one of the things where I'm, like, I cannot go and have a conversation for 10 minutes, like, asking everyone how their day is. By the way, I put up a chef's PSA, like, two days ago. It said, set oh, really? your station first, gossip later. Oh, um, <laughs> I know it's bad, but I gossip first, then I set up my station. They always tell me about that, but... I don't know. I just love my team. I honestly get along with everyone, so that's... I feel, I feel like I agree with that a lot. That's one of the bigger things I feel like I had to overcome coming out of school, going into, like, a restaurant and stuff like that. At school, they show you a lot about setting things up, just like what you mm-hmm. said, or they tell you about mise en place, mise en place, mise en place, but, like, being in, like, in service or prepping or getting ready for service... Time management is really a big yeah. thing. You know, the more time you, you spend goofing off or doing something else or you're talking here or you didn't set this up for your station, you lose, like, all those minutes, they add up. Yeah, every all second life. counts. Yes, it, it really does. So I feel like that's the biggest thing. You know, you have your skills and stuff like that, but I think what going into the industry does or going into a restaurant shows you is, like, where to apply the skills that you learned from from school so when i have a question um i just want to see see what you all respond with when you went to culinary school did you graduate assuming that you would be a chef before you went maybe you think differently now but what was your expectation did you think when you'd graduate from culinary school you would be a chef no 
No, because I've heard from like the chefs that I worked for, like that it doesn't work like that. Like it's you don't graduate and then oh, like I'm a chef. It's like no, you have to like work for it. You have to work your way up. Because yeah, I could graduate culinary school and say that I'm a chef, but I don't know how to run a kitchen. I don't know, you know, all the stations. Well, what, what does the word chef mean to you guys? Um, for me, the word chef, well, a leader. Yeah. Uh, you know, to be exact, the general. You know, back back then. Uh, it's a French term for a uh, leader, general, some, some, something along that line, I, I believe. But uh, me and my roommates were having a talk about this the other day. What, what makes the difference between a chef and like a good chef and like just uh, an all right chef? And yeah, both chefs, like we have, uh, we know these two chefs that are really great at cooking, this and that. But one of them, he'll, they'll tell you something and yes, chef, right away, you, you're on your ass, you know? Yeah. But the other one will, it's kind of like, hey, please, you know, can you can you do this? And you're just like, uh, sure. The, the that that amount of respect of like they they know how to initiate the hustle on you and like they, how they command it. they command you. Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes a that's what stands out a good chef from like a really good chef. Uh, how he could motivate his cooks, his his team, his leaders, his, you know, like his, his army. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Up until recently, um, well, to answer your first question, going into culinary school, coming out, I. I did kind of think that, but like it, it quickly set in having people around me like, okay, nah, I'm, I'm not going to know enough going into this industry to think I'm just going to jump out and be somebody's chef, you know, and uh, recently working with chefs and, you know, being in the industry and stuff and realizing how much chefs have to actually juggle, you know, it really is one of those things where you really have to know what you know really had to have experience behind it you really had to have a skill set underneath all of that exterior you know and there's still so much more to what a chef is you know I, I recall watching this video a while back and a guy said you know what is a chef and he was saying like a chef is like the conductor of a symphony and, and that's a real thing you have to figure out how to get this person to play their part correctly this person to play their part correctly and still have to oversee the whole you know the whole thing so i have a newfound respect more so after you know going into the industry and seeing it and how it actually works you know when when i was a, a young cook uh, just out of culinary school someone offered me a position to be a chef this is a long time ago so i was making like six bucks an hour and they were offering me like 750 so to me it was like big race yeah. 750 <laughs> an hour and i'm gonna be the executive chef and i went to my boss and i said hey I'm, they're gonna make me the executive chef and they said, how much are they going to pay? It was like seven fifty. It's like, okay, well, and how many people work in this kitchen? It's like me and my friend. It's like just two of us, right? It's like, and what are you serving? It's like chicken fingers and hot dogs. Uh, but it was like a, it was like a golf course uh, little food shack, yeah. but they titled it Executive Chef. And so chef normally, um, there's, there's some implication that, that it is in a leadership role when you're the chef, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it, the term gets thrown around that it, it just implies that you're a good cook. And so depending on where you work, the term is going to get thrown around. Usually for me, uh, when someone is a chef, it's usually the title that's on your paycheck. So if you went, I was a chef for, I was an executive chef for 17 years and I was in the culinary world for 27. But if I got hired tomorrow at a restaurant and they hired me to be the fry cook, I couldn't go around telling people, you got to call me chef. Right. Because I'm paid to right. do this job. I'm paid to be the cook. And, and um, I am not the chef of that kitchen. I am the chef of a kitchen that uh, five years ago or whatever. Right. And I, and I think sometimes we we misconstrue that um, what we do is cook. The title is sometimes chef, but we're all cooks. We're all cooks first. And, you know, chefs, depending on where on what position we're holding. So. Yeah, the term, I mean, we could sit here and we could argue back and forth of what that term means, especially now, like, you know, especially on social media, like you got TikTok chefs and things like that. Like, yeah. are, are they chefs? I mean, they have a certain level of culinary acumen. So they, they understand food. They're able to educate, mm -hmm. but they're not really leading. But then again, you could make the argument, if you hire someone to be a, a, a private chef and there's no employees, are they a chef? Exactly. Is where they're, they're, are they just because they're leading themselves? So there is some implication that there is a certain level of skill that's involved. What, um, what are some of the habits that you had in culinary school that you immediately dropped when you went into a real kitchen? Ooh, that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, 
I think um, from culinary school, when I first started in culinary school, I, I, think, I think it was the first month I, I, wasn't, I didn't have any kitchen job and I took it really serious. I, I was like, whoa, all these guys were all climbing up to, you know, wanting, wanting to learn and everything and we're all serious. We're in the kitchen, yeah, chef, you know, very, yeah. very respectable, this, this and that. But right away, once I, I, got, I landed a job and I started seeing uh, how the kitchen starts going and how it is compared to like where you're in the shits and then you go to culinary school, you, you come back and you're like, all right, what's going on here? Like, yeah. it, it's kind of like a lot different. It, it, it's, I don't want to say I lose my respect to towards uh, once, once I'm in the classroom, but I kind of- The intensity. The intensity is gone and you're, you're not there um, hu like hustling, where the, 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 the hustle is there, but I, I think it gives you more of the creativity element to have more freedom in culinary school and you, you get to learn a lot more than when you're in the kitchen. It's you go, you go, you go, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think so. One habit that I had, you know, uh, I felt like in culinary school, I had the time to like focus on one thing, try to make it perfect, isn't it? But when you're in a restaurant, I feel like, you know, there's still room for that, but you have to find that fine line between making it perfect and making it fast. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you have a hundred other things to juggle. You can't afford to spend all of your time on this one thing. You have to do this, that, 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 and make sure it's all done right within, you know, a specific time. Um, I think one of the things that broke me from that, I had a chef to tell me, uh, he was just like, I see you taking your time doing this. And I appreciate the fact that you're trying to get it perfect. He said, but I don't need perfect. I need it fast. Things that can be done perfect, do them perfectly. He said, but things that don't require that much time. He was like, if you're peeling a potato, that doesn't have to be perfect. Just get it done. Mm -hmm. Like, but if you're doing something that requires that intricate level of, you know, perfection, I guess you would say, then do it that way. But you have to find uh, that fine line between fast and, and good. You know what I mean? Did, did you all ever experience this yet? Uh, where you go into a kitchen and they, you've tried to correct your chef and say, well, in school, they actually said this. No. <laughs> yes. Tell me about that. I have. Well, I don't remember like the exact instance, but I, I remember saying that and he just looked at me like, well, you're not in school right now. Like you're at work. So it's like, do it like my way. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. So something that people don't, don't uh, talk about often, but when you're in culinary school, if you're running a culinary school, right? So let's just say you have to teach a thousand people and you have 20 instructors or 50 instructors, right? Mm -hmm. If every instructor knows a different way to make the sauce, because they all know a different way to make the sauce. And then you go from, you know, this class to fundamentals to sauce making, and then you go to the next class. And every single time you go to the next class, they show you a different way. The student's going to be confused. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Because every single chef that's teaching you knows a different way to do it. But if they go and they say, no, no, we're going to say the maripois is this, and the way we do our demi gloss is this, and the way we make our veal stock is that, and the way we make our hollandaise is this. Mm. And they all agree, all 50 instructors agree because someone at the top said, this is the way it's going to be. Then it's easier to teach all the students because they know when you come to my class, I already know that I don't need to re-explain this to you. Mm -hmm. exactly. Right? So part of the problem is then you leave and you go to another place and they say, well, in school... They said it's always this, this, and this. Well, it's not, not, not. They did that to teach you. Right, right. They didn't do that because that's the only way. There's multiple ways to do that. It's, they did that so they could teach you and so they don't confuse the other 1,000 students that are in there and show them a different way. Yeah, I, I had that, that experience where uh, uh, at work or every day during service, we got to make uh, our hollandaise, our, our beurre blanc, right? And mm -hmm. um, I remember my, my chef was like, you know how to make a beurre blanc? Yeah, go, uh, he saw me do it. He was like, what are you doing? Get a deli cup, get a get a, a, a hand blender, and make your quick, quick uh, hollandaise. Here you go, boom, quick, and you're wasting too much time. This and that, and I was like, whoa, they, they didn't teach me this in culinary school. And I remember he told me that he didn't go to culinary school. He spent a, a, around like eight years at this one place, and he built so high up, and he became CDC there. And he said that was my culinary school. That's where I learned how to do a lot of problem solving, how to think quick on my feet, how to have the all that stuff. And I was like, wow, that's. Some things where you don't really see or, or learn when you're in in school, but it, it gives you an idea of what you're heading to, I'd say. Yeah. Um, I feel like when I was in school, I had um, 
I want to say my one-on-one chef, he did tell me, he like, a lot of the stuff we're teaching you, he said, these are guidelines. Yeah. He said, never go into another chef's kitchen telling them this when you learned at school because they're going to curse you out. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, he was like, man, he said, whatever chef's kitchen you're in, the way they want it done, that's the right way to do it. That's uh, one of one of the most important, you know, I have the chef's PSA, one of the most important chef's PSA I always say is the right way to do it is the way they do it in your kitchen and the way your chef wants it done. It doesn't exactly. matter how you did it at the last job. It doesn't matter how they taught you in school. It doesn't matter the way you like it. Just do it the way it is. Mm-hmm. The right way is where you're at. That's how they want it done because there really is no right or wrong way. It's, you know, mm. what's the most efficient way to get it on the plate and make it extremely delicious. That's the right way. One thing I wanted to ask is uh, how do you, like, know when you're on the borderline or on the edge of burning of burnout? Burnout is, a, I think, is a huge part in this industry that many people just, I see that they, they wanted it because it's very competitive and they wanted to reach to the top and they get so lost into the craft that they just do too much and their head starts spinning and next thing you know, that that, it, that passion is kind of gone. How do, you, how do you prevent that or what, what are your uh, opinions on about that? Um, well, I, I think with regards to burnout, I think there's two types of burnout typically. There's physical burnout and then there's mental burnout. And they're not the same. Um, if you were in a kitchen where you loved everyone that you worked with and you were allowed to be very creative and you enjoyed it and the people were friendly and these are your best friends and maybe your significant other, your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever is also there or, or your secret girlfriend, boyfriend <laughs> is there and you're happy to go to work every single day, you might want to be there 80 hours a week because you don't want to be at home. Right. You enjoy being in this environment. You can't wait to get back in the kitchen because you're so motivated. Right. And you're working 80 hours a week and you're not burned out. On the flip side, you take the opposite environment. You don't like the chef. They're mean to you. You don't like your coworkers. You have no creativity. You have no freedom. You're constantly um, in the shit. You're always behind. It's dirty. You could be burned out after 20 hours a week. So you have two two ends of the spectrum where one person's able to work 80 hours a week and want to work 90, and the other person barely wants to finish their 20. So a lot of burnout ha- has to do with are you enjoying it? So I, I think sometimes what we attribute to burnout can simply be attributed to I don't like my job, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily that you're burned out. It's just I don't like my job. Yeah. Um, and then there's physical burnout. Physical burnout happens because you haven't gotten enough sleep, mm. right? You've been working, you know, two jobs and going to school and you've only slept three hours. Right. Um, you've been on your feet all day. Your knee is hurting. Your back is hurting. You, you've been sick and you haven't had time to go to the doctor, right? Mm. You're not drinking enough water. The line is hot. The kitchen's hot. You have physical and mental stress. That's a different type of burnout, right? So um, it's really it's really important to identify those things. Those, are you physically burned out? Do you just need to sleep more? Right. Right. Are you going to work all day and then, um, you know, you're working a 10 hour shift and then you're going and partying for five hours and then you're wondering why you're not feeling good the next day at work. So I think it's important to identify what type of burnout you're experiencing and is it truly burnout or do you just not like your job? Right. Because I think that's that's the first question I think that needs to be answered. People get confused uh, a lot of times uh, where they they ask themselves, oh, I I don't think I I think I'm getting burned out. This is that sometimes I don't think they just liked it in, in the first place. I don't when I think when you get into this industry, you got to be prepared mentally that mm-hmm. it's not going to be fun. It, there's, it's going to get dirty. It's going to get rough. It's going to get crazy, almost like psychotic. Uh, you're going to start hearing the the ticket machine go out in the middle of the night. And you're like, whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> or the <laughs> oven beeping. The oven beeping. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think you got to be ready for a lot of that stuff. And personally, I, I was... I, I thought about it and I, I knew I wanted to head there. And now that, like I said, I love both of my jobs. Uh, I love all my coworkers. Which love- one do you like more though? No, I'm just kidding. I'm not- <laughs> <laughs> Which chef do you like better? Come on. I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> they're very different. I'll, I'll say they're very different jobs. One job, uh, it's really high pace, fast, 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 sending the food out while it was, you know, of course, still making it really nice, great. And the people there, I love them. You know, my coworkers, those are my guys. Yeah. And then you have my other job. The other job is, I feel like that's almost like my culinary school. It's uh, everything is, um, they teach you a lot every day. They, they're on your ass, keep it clean. It, very high standards that I believe that it's there. And every day you, you get better every yeah. day there. And 
that's what I enjoy. Uh, I enjoy to to get better. Of course, that, that's what we're all here to do in the industry. I believe yeah, you know we all want to reach up and get better. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I know you said you have been a chef for uh, you said like twenty some years, right? Um, I guess having seen the highs and lows of this industry, coming from being a culinary student to being a CDC and all of that, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give to someone in our place? Uh, a couple. Work in kitchens you aspire to run. I would say that, that, that goes back to why I asked you the question, what type of chef do you want to be when you grow up? Because if you said, I want to be a three Michelin star chef, You'll never become a three Michelin star chef working, you know, at a, at a restaurant that doesn't serve that type of food. Exactly. The quickest way to become a three Michelin star chef is to go work at a three Michelin star restaurant and fully understand what that type of environment is. Mm-hmm. If you said, I want to have the best barbecue restaurant in the world, I would say, well, start by working in a barbecue, barbecue. restaurant. You're never going to learn how to become the best barbecue uh, restaurant in the world working on a cruise ship. Right. Right. So a lot of times I think when we're in culinary school, we think we're not good enough to go into these. I'll I'll go when I'm ready. It doesn't work that way. You're not going to be ready ever. You have to go. And that's how you get Mm -hmm. ready. So step one, identify what type of chef you want to be and then work in those types of kitchens and learn how to run them by being in them, because you're not going to learn how to run those kitchens if you're not in them. So that's that's one bit of advice. The other bit of advice um, and it's it's along the same lines, but it's not exactly the same. Is it's better to be the worst cook in an amazing kitchen, in a great kitchen, than it is to be an amazing cook in a terrible mm-hmm. kitchen. And a lot of people they are afraid of being great. I'm sorry, they're they're afraid of not being great, so they're okay with being in a bad environment. So they can say, "Well, I'm great here." So you, know, you can the, send out. Can, King of the rats, right. you know what I mean? Like, exactly. Like, well, that that's not making you better. You're mm-hmm. better off going into a kitchen where you're where everyone's better than you, but you're going to learn so, so much, much, and eventually you're going to become that person that's better than everyone else. It's hard to be around sharks and not become one, you know. That's my answer to that question. I have a question. Um, would spin like your guys' worst and like best shift in the years of working in the kitchen? Worst and best shifts. Uh... Talking about worst shifts, it happened <laughs> not too long ago. Uh, it was a really, really tough night, like serving close to 300 covers almost. Oh my and, God. Um, at the position where, where I work at is a lead line position where I get, I'm, I'm on grill station and the tickets come out to me and I'm reading them off to tell everybody to fire when, when everything's ready. And in the middle of it, I just, my mind starts to lose itself, go blank. Mm-hmm. And I feel it's when like you start fading away when it, that's when you start going down yeah you gotta constantly keep moving keep moving and i was moving with the pace and i was so far behind and that's I, rough yeah i sure. had to get pulled out of the weeds real quick but we ended up yeah. kind of getting it through and uh, you know having good people around you they'll know when you need help and i think that's that's where having a good family you know exactly. surrounding you know when everything is uh needed not uh, but that was a tough day. <laughs> oh, yeah, that happens. How do you handle a tough day? Uh, I know a lot of a lot of cooks and a lot of chefs out here. They say the bar is probably the best way to handle a tough <laughs> yeah. day. I have a beer after. It's not the best way. It's not the best way. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. no, the the uh, I'd say what I learned from those experiences is that those days are there for a reason. I, I think everything happens for a reason, and those days that ha- those days happen because you learn from them you learn what you did wrong. For example, that day, I knew what I did wrong was I didn't ask for help. Uh, right. When Which, you're... very important that you bring that up. Mm-hmm. You didn't ask for help. I didn't ask for help. I was in the shits and I saw everybody moving and I was lost, blank in my head, and I didn't ask for help. Cause I was like, well, I don't know what's going on. I'm a sticky but So one of the biggest things that I think a lot of, uh, biggest mistakes I think a lot of cooks make and I used to make this mistake all the time I never wanted to ask for help because right. I wanted to prove I could do it on my own exactly. and you don't need to help me yep. but when I was a cook I never used to ask for help and when I became a chef I would ask for help for everything so this this kind of illustrates a different mindset shift is when you become a chef you realize everything requires help yeah. you cannot you do it hands. by yourself you need hands for everything and you also realize when you become the chef is that when it goes bad 
it goes bad for everybody. It goes bad for the restaurant. It goes bad for the chef. It goes bad for the team. And so that one individual that didn't want to ask for help because their ego said, I don't need the help because I don't want to look bad. You hurt everyone. You hurt the yeah. customer. You hurt the guest. You hurt the server. You hurt their tip. You hurt the chef's reputation. You got the bad Yelp review. Like just by not asking for help because uh, you didn't want to for whatever reason, you hurt the entire organization. So one of the things that I learned uh, maybe a little bit too late as a chef was that ask for help. I want cooks to ask for help. When people are working for me, I want, if you're in a position where you're going to hurt my service, I want to know about it. I want to yes. know about it before it's too late. <laughs> so that's a great yeah, answer. Yeah, You asked about like a bad shift and stuff like that. I remember, you know, and, and this goes back to the thing about time management <clears throat> that I was saying. Like, I remember there was a time I was like working and I, don't, I can't remember specifically what the prep was, but same thing. Didn't ask for help. Thought I'd wing it on my own. Right. Messed up in it. Like, I know at least 10 to 15 different dishes because I was like, you know what? I want to get this done. I don't want shift to be on my ass. But then he was anyway. You know, <laughs> that didn't ask. You know, but it's one of those things where, like, just like you said, you, you have to get to the point of understanding, like, even though it's your prep, it's your station and stuff like that, if you don't have it right or you don't ask for help when you need it, it brings down the rest of service. Exactly. Because, you know, think about it, that, that dish you 86 that's lost money or that thing you didn't ask for help for, burn somebody else on their station, that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's one of the big things. I, and yeah. I recently learned that. Yeah, for, for everybody that's yeah. listening out there, ask for help. Yeah. I, I, I promise you. Sometimes you could ask for help because you're lazy and you're like, oh, can I get some help? And then you're like, okay, I'm going to go smoke a cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 like, don't right, be that right. person. Don't no one likes that person. <laughs> but, but if you ask for help, if you truly need it, don't ask for help because you want to goof off. If you ask for help, um, I, I, I think a, a good chef will also recognize when you need help and be like, okay, go. I, I know I used to, when I'd be wandering around the kitchen, right. I'd go tap another who say, go help them. They don't, they don't need help. No, trust me. They do yeah. go, go help yeah. them. No. Yeah. Going, uh, going back to what you're saying, what was the worst to the best? The best day I'll say was also not too long ago after I learned that mistake of asking to need help, we got slammed again, another, another hard night, but this time I came prepared. Uh, I came prepared in the aspect of I, what, what I learned from the prior time, ask for help. I, I was telling my, my executive chef, yo, chef, I need bring me tomahawks, bring me a third pan of halibuts, bring me this. And yeah. there he go. He would go running around. Cause he knew yeah, I was, and the food was coming out amazing. Nothing, nothing was getting sent back. And I think that was, you, you look at the time you start service at five and then you look back at, you look at the clock, it's already nine going back that quick. And you're like, wow, that was amazing service. Everybody was having fun. Everybody's laughing, cheering you on. Yeah. And I work in an open kitchen as well. And which, and it's kind of cool when you're seeing customers look at you and like, Give you a nice thumbs up and yeah. here they, they give you a soda well, here and there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's oh. great. Oh yeah. Yeah, it does make a difference when you ask for help. Yeah, definitely. On the back end of that, I would like to ask, as a chef, do you feel like it's also equally as important for a chef to facilitate a environment where your cooks can ask for help? Because I've been in kitchens where I wanted to ask, but I felt like I was put in a space where is tough to ask. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, and I and I feel like a lot of us coming out of culinary school, that's a that's a lesson that we're all still actively learning. But if you feel like you're in an environment where you can't say something or you can't, you know, mm -hmm. ask it's for the, that without it being a, It's the chef's yeah. responsibility to make sure that they're curating an environment for success. Right. However they get to that point. So every chef is gonna curate that environment slightly different, but the end goal is I need to curate an environment where my team could succeed because if the team succeeds, I succeed and the restaurant succeeds exactly. and everyone's happy. Doors remain open. One of the things though, with that being said, um, is that sometimes as a chef, when you write out of culinary school, like, okay, so let's, let's rewind to when you started culinary school, when you didn't know what you were doing, like people that were three months ahead of you, they seem like, man, they know so much, right? Mm -hmm. When you don't know what you're doing, like, wow, they know how to use their knife. They already know right. the mother sauces. Um, and the people that are graduating, that are a year ahead of you, they know everything, right? Like, oh my God, they're graduating. They're ready to go work in some great restaurants. I wish I could. And, and you know, it's like those, those people that are graduating are looking down on you like, Psh. 
I'm about to graduate. Yeah. You don't even know how to hold your knife, right? right? And then you look at the instructors like they walk on water because they know so much, right? Mm. When you get into a kitchen and you just graduate and you now you go into a kitchen and you say, well, I just graduated from culinary school. You're back at zero because yeah. everyone in that kitchen already knows yeah. how to cook. They've all gone to culinary school. They have five years of experience on you and they're looking at you like you went to culinary school. So what? You're yeah. slowing me down. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot in a lot of cases. Um, and then you look at that five year line cook, like they're walk on water. And then you look at the executive chef and so on that they walk on water. But here's what really happens is that the person that is zero brand new culinary school and the person that's one year, there's a big gap. There's a big gap between one year and two years of experience. But when you get to about five years, it all kind of levels out. Like you can't really tell the difference between a five-year cook and a 10-year cook and a, and a 10-year cook and a 15-year cook and a 20-year cook and a 27-year cook. You, they all kind of cook the same after mm-hmm. a certain point. After about five years, the playing field levels out pretty much mm-hmm. um, as far as pots, pans, knives, techniques go. Everyone, they, you know, they, they're pretty solid across the board. Um, and so once you get to that point of leveling off, it's like, okay, a five-year cook can outcook a 27-year cook. And so what does this have to do with kind of to your question is in most kitchens, everyone's a five-year cook and there's a big gap between the culinary student and the five-year cook. And so when we're trying to curate that environment, sometimes it's very difficult for these people that are in the kitchen. I'm not talking about the executive chef. I'm talking about the other cooks on the line or the other cooks in the kitchen. They don't have the patience to work with someone that doesn't know what they're doing mm-hmm. because they're just thinking, I have this mountain of a prep list. And I need to get it done. And it becomes a little bit of a frustration for them. Like, hey, I have a question. What do you think? <laughs> it's like, don't yeah. ask me the question. Just right. chop the like, onion. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Like we have all these onions to chop and you want to ask me questions. Like at school, they showed me to chop the onion this way. What do you think is the best way? It's like sometimes they're like, I don't have time for this. Mm-hmm. Um, and event, I hate to say eventually. The truth of the matter is you all are going to turn into those cooks that are going to be like, I don't have time to answer your silly yeah. questions, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of the cycle of life. But I, I, think, I think there's a certain level of, yes, you, you have to create the environment so everyone is successful, but you also have to understand like it doesn't mean that you get a pass to be slow because you're expected to pick it up pretty quick. Exactly. Definitely. Yeah. I think uh, in, this, in this industry, it's, uh, a lot of, uh, it's a lot about the hustle. Uh, how motivated you are to keep on going fast. You you could see a lot of culinary students, or yeah, a lot of a lot of people out here in the industry. You could you could tell who's got it and who doesn't. I feel like a lot of people have, have said it and told me that like in this Hold industry. On. Let's stop right there. How do you know when they got it and when they don't? Uh, I'd say you could tell by their mentality, by how how much they actually put into the work, how much hustle. You could I, I've seen a couple. A couple, a couple ca- classmates were, were over here closing down the kitchen and they're over there kicking their feet and uh, just just not not really putting putting their effort in it. And then there's also the, that one guy who, hey, let's get going. Let's get, hey, you get doing going to this. Hey, yeah. you start sweeping over here. Hey, you can tell who's uh, actually willing to put their, their, their part in it. And going into kitchens, uh, I saw a couple, couple, I had a couple of coworkers who, we're kind of just there, like, uh, what's going on here? This and that. Move a little slower. Other than that, other guy, wait, chef, what do you need me to do? Chef, let me hop on some prep. Chef, let me. And yeah. I think that's how you could tell mm-hmm. kind of who sees, who's got it and who doesn't. Absolutely. That hunger is just is one of those things that's hard to pass up. Right. Like, you, you can see it on a person that, that wants it, wants to know more, wants to go further and stuff like that. Pass the person who's, I'm just going to do it. Do, do you see it when you were in school with them? Yeah. yeah, like the co- the other students Absolutely. in the class, you, you yeah. look at them and you're like, that one's going yeah. yeah. to be somebody. You might not want to admit it right oh, there, yeah. there, but like, damn, I hate oh. that one. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> Most <laughs> definitely. When I, was yeah. in school, well, when I was in school, I feel like I was the person that was hungry or still is hungry, you know, in a lot of cases. And, you know, nobody's clicking on 100% every single day. Mm-hmm. I'm human. Right. But, mm-hmm. you know, the, the goal is to keep learning, keep pushing, you know, the things I didn't know, I was hungry to find out more about them. The stuff I was passionate about, it's just like I was always trying to immerse myself in that stuff. And it's, it's pretty much the same way in the industry. When you find those people 
Like, and, I, and I'm sure everybody has one in their kitchen. Like, yeah. I'd like to be like that person. Like, I, they mm -hmm. they always have their stuff prepped up. It's like they they move like a machine, the fastest person in the kitchen, and they're always hungry to learn more. One, one of the problems that you'll face uh, in the industry is it's really easy to make it a race to the bottom. Because it's, it's easy to complain and be like, well, they're not working hard. I'm not going to work hard. And, yeah. and they messed up, so why do, well, I'm not going to try hard if they don't try hard. Um, and unfortunately, that just breeds more of that. So the right thing to do is when you're in those kitchens, like, don't compare your, compare yourself to the best person and be better than them. Exactly. exactly right? yeah. Just think about how you can Im improve yourself. And, and then it becomes contagious because then everyone wants to start getting better. Okay, so let's change the subject. Now that you guys are working, I'll tell you as a chef, I used to see a lot of bullshit come my way because people think that we're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So let's talk about some of the bullshit that goes on. Like, you guys know chefs have done all the dirty tricks already like yeah uh, like you post on instagram that you're out partying and then you call out the next day and say oh they sorry. know they, they know they know what are some of those dirty tricks that you guys are seeing right now in the restaurant world oh okay. that you think that you think people are being fooled but we know they're not being fooled what do you guys have? i don't know that's hard when was the last time you called out when was the last time i called out yeah and was it real Today. <laughs> it's a good I, reason to call out. Yeah. I, did, I called out today to come here. To be, to, to be, uh, uh, uh -oh. I've yeah. only called out once. You? Uh, I've only called out today. Well, today? <laughs> today, yeah. Thank you. Last time I called out. Were you faking it? 50-50. Oh, <laughs> like, sorry, Oscar, if you see this. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. Were you, were you sick? But you weren't sick? Well, it's because I get a lot of nosebleeds. Um, so I got one, but I called in. I was like, Hey, like, I don't feel well, but I still went out that same day. And I think and he, knew, he knew. He <laughs> knew. By the way, when, they know. whenever they someone calls know. out, the chefs can be like, check their Instagram or were they last night? Yeah. Yep. I think I like blocked them from seeing my story or something. <laughs> That's a smart one. Yeah. I had the flu, so like, you actually had the flu. I actually had the flu. Uh, That's understood. Yeah. Look, when people are sick, they should. Like, the last thing you want mm -hmm. is to get the entire kitchen team sick. Oh, definitely. Oh man, I've been in the kitchen with some people. I have been the person trying to work through it, and like I've seen other chefs try to do it, and then like the whole kitchen gets sick, and everybody yeah, it's there. horrible. Like it's, it's crazy, man. It's and everybody's in there still trying to prep up, still trying to prep up, and you know, it, it's wild though, being sick and pushing through. In the in the early days of you know when I was when I was coming up as a chef. It's like it was frowned upon to call off. I mean, I, I will tell you this. I think I didn't call off for 17 years. Like, I went 17 oh, years wow. without a call off. Um, and when I finally called off is because I was like, I had to go to the hospital. Like, I was, yeah. I was truly sick. But it was like, you got a cold, so what? You know, that, that's, that's just kind of the way that we used to work back then. Um, and it wasn't until I really got sick that I realized I should probably call off. Like, it, it finally went off, mm -hmm. but it, I didn't go off after, you know, until the latter part of my career. Um, but yeah, you see a lot of, a lot of these things that, um, chefs are not dumb and all the tricks that people try, the chefs have seen it and you see it all yeah, the time. Yeah, they know. They know, like no, no one's being fooled. So I think, you know, for, for people listening, no one is fooled. No one is fooled. Everyone knows, Hey, that's the lazy person that likes to take a cigarette mm -hmm. break when it's time right. to clean up. You know, everyone knows when you can't find something in the walk-in freezer, it's because you, <laughs> it's because you, it was, it was cold. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was just cold. You didn't want to yeah. look too hard. Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's, there's nothing worse than when you come out. Hey, chef, I, I noticed that I couldn't find the French fries in the freezer. Do you know if we're out? And then the chef walks in. You mean these French fries? Yeah, right it's here? like right in front They're of your right, face. Oh, okay. that, right that always happens to me. Yeah. Oh, it's funny. I swear, it's tough. It's a it's tough. Yeah, the chef would go in behind me, man, and it almost made me feel like a jackass sometimes. Cause I would go in there and actively be looking but actively overlooking it, I guess. I don't yeah. know. And he'd go right in. Yeah. You're like, oh, I'm sorry. So <laughs> what, what, what is next? What are you guys going to do with yourselves? What's the next step in your career? Well, for me, I do want to go to a different school. I do want to extend um, my education. How I said earlier, hopefully I can go to New York or Spain. Those are my two options right I, now. I highly recommend if you can travel. If, you could, if, you're, if someone's listening and you're a culinary student, and you could afford to travel abroad, and you have those means. Take advantage, right? O I really open, want to open yourself up to the world, learn different cuisines. So, yeah, I, I hope you do. Go, yeah. go to great restaurants. Yeah, once I graduate, um, that's my plan. Hopefully, yeah, I'm really excited. Yeah. 
I would like to do that at some point as well, like go see other places. My dream, honestly, is like going to Italy, like maybe for a year or two. And um, If anyone's study. listening and wants to finance this dream to Italy, reach out to me. I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all Let's for go. It. Yeah, Let's like send a that. chef to Italy that wants to learn. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been talking to my wife about it. Uh, maybe when our lease is up, maybe going somewhere like uh, New York or Chicago or something. Just, just like you were saying, immersing myself in those kitchens that I wanted to learn from. So um, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So going to, to that, I, I had the thought of uh, what's, what's going to be the plan to me and uh, my roommates. Me and my roommates were always uh, on scouting out different restaurants and the, they went to Chicago not too, about a week ago or two mm -hmm. and they scouted out some restaurants out there and some, some nice Michelin restaurants. They got the opportunity to go see the back of house and check, check it out and they came back and we realized that there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a lot of great places here in Austin. You know, Austin's growing rapidly fast and- Michelin's uh, coming to Texas. Michelin's, oh, Michelin guys are coming mm -hmm. to Texas and I know, hopefully, that's so you know, exciting. I, I think, I think maybe Austin's got, it's got a couple under its yeah. sleeve that we could potentially maybe mm -hmm. build a, build a community more than it already is in the past five years. I believe Austin has been one of the growest fastest uh, food industries that, yeah. in, a, in a while. And, that's why I decided to, to come here. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm not from here. I'm actually from Arizona, mm -hmm. and uh, straight from out of high school, I decided let me let me come out here and great restaurants, great chefs with a lot of experience. And I think the the plan is to keep on learning. Uh, find find those sharks. Find those sharks where you're gonna get yes. better. That are always gonna be calling you out on on things like they're not going to let you send out shit food they're going to tell take, you take the path of greater resistance a lot of people just take the path of least resistance the easy way out exactly mm -hmm. the path of greater resistance that's where the glory is Definitely. and there's you don't want to you don't want to be an npc right Definitely. never mm -hmm. no npcs okay. um do you guys think there's like a right timing to start in the kitchen if it's too early or too late and like does age matter well i, I I'm, I'm i'm not sure well I'm, I'll say I'm pretty young. I, I started, uh, barely started getting in the kitchen about uh, a year ago. But then again, my roommate, he he started getting in the industry since he was 14. He said he started oh, wow. out the dishwasher and kept going up. But at the way we're kind of looking now, we're head ahead. You know, I, I always like to say this is a very competitive uh, industry, yeah, very competitive yeah. industry. We're all trying to reach the top. You know, like like sharks, like we had said, and uh, I, we all want to be the greatest and. Sometimes you look at yourself and you see your coworkers. They, they, they might be of age, maybe 30s and up, and you're like, "Wow, I, I think I could mm -hmm. really be as good as this guy in a couple of years." And I think that the age is is something where um, I don't think you could. There's a right time. I think everybody has their own their own growing experience. Yeah, their own path. Yeah, yeah. their own path. I think everybody has. Just like you say, everybody got their own starting line. Uh, me personally, I feel like I'm starting later than a lot of the people that you know, that I have been surrounded by. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm 33, um, but I can know a guy who's 20, just turned 21, and he has been in the kitchen since he was like 15, and he's mm -hmm. a beast. Oh, I, wow. I'm talking about absolute beast. Like, I, I will say this, is that age isn't as important as how healthy your body is, because you might be, you know, 20, but feel like you're 50, and you might be 50 and feel like you're 20, mm -hmm. because it is a physical, physically demanding job you still got to lift turn twist squat mm -hmm. you're, you're putting heavy pots on the stove so I, I i think uh age doesn't matter but how well you've maintained yourself yeah. matters more because it is a physically i mean kitchens are hot you're on your feet all day right. that that unfortunately is not going to change no matter which kitchen you're in but mm -hmm. anyway chefs this was really fun um where can people find you give your instagram a shout out uh, Instagram, uh, Garcia Axel, G-A-R-C-I-A-A-X-C-E-L. For me, Vix underscore 23, V-I-C-S underscore 23. Uh, mine is at that kid legit is D-A-T underscore K-I-D underscore L-E-G-I-T. I'm going to wow. steal that name, that kid. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, All right. That's, 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 that's a pretty good name. That's a good name. All right, chefs, thank you so much. Thank you for having thank us. You. Well, I hope you enjoyed that show as much as I did. If you want to support the show, you know what to do. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe button. If you're on Spotify or any other streaming app, make sure you leave five stars, nothing less than five stars. Go to chefspsa.com where you get every single book I've written, including the audiobooks and the new one I just put out, Bad Cooks Everywhere. 
now available in Spanish and audio. If you want more exclusive content, behind the scenes, special episodes, and early access to episodes, become a premium subscriber on my Substack for only $10 a month. You get early access to podcasts, eBooks, video courses, and an exclusive discount on all the Chef's PSA merchandise from the store. Totally worth the $10 a month. We'll see you next week. Hit the porno music. Yo, it's my Andre in the kitchen. Mix it. Dropping chef knowledge. No fiction. Stirring up the beats. Heating up the session. Listen close. Class is in session.